do that. And then um, what we usually do is post the recording onto Citizen Network website and then again onto uh, social media pages. So um, really excited about today. So the topic is freedom, um, which feels like an enormous topic. So I'm really um, yeah, eager and excited to hear from Leanne and John, who are our guest speakers this morning. Um, before we get stuck into the session, I just want to pay, um, acknowledge the first people of Australia, because we're not actually meeting in Perth today, we're meeting across Australia, and um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so we've got an hour and a half, and um, what we usually do, Leanne and John, so welcome to the session, what we usually do is a bit of a check-in. And the check-in, the, the last couple that we've done anyway, we've tried to kind of keep the question focused on the topic. Um, and that way it gives you a kind of introduction to who's here in the room. So um, what I was thinking for today was that if we could just uh, let John and Leanne know who you are, what your uh, kind of reason for being on this call is. So whether um, you're working in an organization, a family member, um, an ally, somebody who's curious. Um, and I suppose what springs to mind for you um, in kind of preparing for the session around freedom? And it's a huge topic, so uh, it isn't a test, it's just where does, where's your head at starting the webinar? So I'll call on each other, if that's okay, just because that keeps us quite um, speedy. Uh, so I'll start with Katrina. Katrina, I'm starting with you because you were here first. Hi everybody, um, my name is Katrina Mirko, I work for Avivo here in Western Australia. Um, why I'm on this call, uh, working as a recovery guide in mental health, freedom, um, control and choice comes up quite a bit when we're on somebody's recovery and I'd really like to hear from some people that could maybe challenge my thinking and change how I do some work and um, put some real mindfulness into how we achieve this for some of the most vulnerable people we work with particularly when we're working with clinical systems and overarching authority in their life. Fabulous, thanks Katrina. Steve? Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, two o'clock in the morning <laughs> here in oh. the UK. <laughs> so I, I have to be keen. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, as I've said before, I'm somebody who's uh, worked in services for most of my life and I'm now working on a PhD about citizenship for young people who have uh, learning disabilities. And uh, I guess I'm trying to get some precision around the concept of freedom, otherwise it just is like kind of one of those West Coast songs, as it were, and, and you know, it, it needs to have meaning and purpose. Otherwise, um, it just goes everywhere. Fabulous. Thank you, Steve. And my absolute respect for getting up at two o'clock in the morning to join us. Welcome, welcome. Um, Bridget. Uh, good morning. I'm Bridget Scott. I work at CAMCAN in Western Australia as a training manager. And my interest in this topic is around, I guess, bringing to the awareness of support workers and perhaps coordinators in the organisation, but hopefully they've got some sense of it around um, uh, the complacency around freedom and the freedoms that they have and the ones that are denied the people that we support. So that's me. Thanks Bridget. Jules? Uh, I'm Jules. I work for Avivo as well um, in rural Western Australia um, and I, I work um, within the mental health team. And I'm also studying my Bachelor of Social Work at the moment. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a bit creepy today. Um, just thinking about freedom, I know for me, it's one of the most important, I guess, values that I have in my life. So I'm really um, excited about learning more about, um, I guess, how to assist people to have that, that same sense of freedom that I enjoy. Um, because like Katrina, you know, working with really vulnerable people who don't have a lot of choice, and um, all, all freedom. So excited to be here. Thank you, Jules. Nick? Hi, folks. Uh, so Nick Maisie, I'm in Perth with a community development organisation called Befriend. Um, 
maybe similar to Jules for me, I'm like freedom is a, a value of mine that's really important to me. I think I haven't really appreciated that quite as significantly until more recently. Um, it's even been on my mind a lot just in this last week because um, as part of my role, I'm, I'm involved in workforce development and consulting style engagements with different groups of community sector staff and had quite a challenging experience in a workshop with a group of staff um, with an organization that I'm doing some work with. And when I was reflecting on what was so challenging about that experience later, um, it was it was this notion of freedom that was coming up, this, this sense that perhaps the people in the room didn't actually feel a sense of freedom in, in even being there. And in a way, I'd been positioned to represent um, some structural forces that don't actually really support or enable freedom for people. And then and how that sort of uh, really creates attention for me internally. So, yeah, lots going on for me at the moment. Um, and really looking forward to this discussion. Thanks, Nick. Bev? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Bev and I work um, for Aviva, uh, dealing with a lot of people, um, not personally myself interacting with them, but listening to a lot that goes on out in our community. Freedom for me um, just springs to mind um, the reason why we're here in Australia, coming from South Africa with a very, um, very, very hard way of living and bringing up children for myself when my husband and I decided to actually make the decision and, and leave. It was a big, big decision. But honestly, the freedom that we, we made the choice, we made the decision and the, we just felt free when we actually landed. And um, I try and just live my life every day thinking how lucky we are to have that and a lot of people out there don't have choice to be able to be free. So yeah, that's what it means for me. Thank you, Bev. Uh, Jacqueline, we can't see you, Jacqueline, so your camera's not on. So if you are there, yeah, you're off mute. Are you able to you turn me? your camera on, Jackie? Um, I'm having a few, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, good. Um, sorry, I'm having a few computer issues. So computer okay, no problem. Thing in the background. Are you happy to check in? I'm with Identity WA, and we support a range of, of people with a whole range of different disabilities and different capacities. So I suppose the thing for me is to really try and assist us as an organisation and our staff to use every opportunity we can to maximise freedom across the range of people. So some people can perhaps more readily exercise freedoms than others, but it doesn't mean to say that we can't, um, you know, work to further that to an even greater extent, even if someone does have quite a good deal of, you know, freedom of choice and, and um, freedom of expression. So I'm interested in the discussion. And I'll try and get my IT issues worked out shortly. Okay, no problem. We know you're there, Jackie, so uh, okay. thank you. Um, Rachel? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Rachel. I am in Perth. Um, I work with an organisation called Inclusion WA. So I do a mix of direct support alongside clients, um, but also work to support and assist with the training of other staff. Um, so what I'm interested in, um, I guess it's interesting that Nick mentioned this idea of, I guess, this structural uh, systematic, I guess, forces that are Im impeding freedom, because I guess what I'm interested in is, is looking at how we can go beyond, I guess, just those day-to-day -day moments where we can empower people's freedom and control and choice of your, over their own lives, but also, um, I guess, maybe making some of those bigger systemic changes because it feels a bit disheartening when, um, if I'm working alongside a client, for example, and I, I can empower their choice and freedom within the time I'm working with them, but then they go back to maybe living in a, in a situation where they have many freedoms impeded. So I guess looking at how we can go 
beyond just the work I'm doing and to advocate for people's freedoms on, I guess, a larger scale and maybe removing some of those systematic, uh, I guess, systematic things that are impeding people's freedom. Fabulous, thank you, Rachel. Um, Alex, we can't see you. Oh, we can see you, hello, Alex. Oh, and we can see you've done something to your head. Um, hello, welcome. We're just checking in, Alex, and um, we're just introducing ourselves to Leanne and John um, in relation to who our name is, what's our connection, and what kind of comes up for you when you think about today's topic in relation to freedom. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it. I'll go next. Um, so I'm Kate, uh, I work with Avivo. I also work with Waze and with Citizen Network, I'm busy. And um, in relation to today's topic, it's slightly different. I feel like I've been on a journey the last few years, looking particularly at the workforce and what the keys to citizenship means for people who work in our organisation and other organisations. And this thing about freedom, uh, I can honestly say in working with support workers and talking about the keys has significantly change the way that I think organizations should um, should uh, support staff to do a really good job and um, we're certainly in the middle of a process that explores what does freedom at work look like um, so yeah I'm really interested in the whole topic for all of us really uh, not just people who are considered to be disadvantaged what does that look like so that's my interest. Um, hello. Alex, are you happy to go next? Um, not really. <laughs> not really. Okay, no problem. Well, we know you're here, so uh, we'll, com we'll come back to you. Wasn't sure yeah. working or not. It is working, but we can come back to you. I'm sorry, I completely missed the question also. So. <laughs> right, don't worry, don't worry. We'll carry on and then we'll come back to you. So Leanne and John, are you happy to check in um, and tell us, I, I'm sure everybody does know who you are, but um, if you're happy to do a bit of an introduction. Leanne, can I call on you first? Yep. Hello everybody. Um, my name's Leanne, I'm from WA, I work with a little organisation, uh, Western Australia's Individualised Services. Um, we're not a service provider, we're uh, uh, an organisation that I guess supports people, families and service providers to think about what um, a good life means to people um, with individualised support. So uh, the topic of freedom is really um, something that has been um, really critical to our work over many, many years and um, what I guess we're learning more about what it looks like when people do have genuine freedom and then when it looks like people have freedom but actually don't and how we can get better at walking alongside people in being able to explore um, and I guess unpack a little bit about what freedom means to them as well. Um, yeah, so I'm really interested in hearing from everybody today um, about uh, their experiences as well. Fabulous, thanks Leanne. John? I'll get used to this sooner or later. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to the chance to hear what folks are thinking about this really important uh, topic. I think that Sometimes we make it way too easy uh, and therefore we miss the opportunities to understand what liberation is about and what freedom is for. So I look forward to the discussion. Okay, fabulous, thank you. Um, so that's the way that we'd normally structure our sessions. We'd do a check-in and then we'd hand over to the speakers and it's entirely up to you how you want to run the session. So um, we know we've had some conversation beforehand, but if you want it to be a kind of open session, then just let us know that we're, happy, we're able to ask questions as you go, or if you'd rather go for a kind of chunk of time and then we'll ask questions. What works best for you, John and Leanne? 
Um, it's fine with me for to be open to discussion as we go along. Okay, cool. Okay. We've also got we've also got some time uh, set aside for for that as well. Basically, there are sort of three pieces. Uh, I've got a short introduction. Leanne's going to share some of her experience, and then we'll kind of focus in a little deeper on freedom in the context of the keys to citizenship. And in between, or any time along the way, we'd be happy to, I'd be happy to have people uh, join in however they feel like they'd like to feel free. Okay, fabulous. Thank you, John. So we'll hand over to you then, John, if you're starting. All right, let me see if I can make this work. I want to show you some slides. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, Wendy asked us a question in the first uh, session, which I had the, the chance to watch. And what she said is all people need support, not just people with learning difficulties. So why is there always a question when a person with learning difficulties wants to make a decision? And I wanna come back to this toward the end, but I just like to invite, invite you to take 30 seconds to form an answer to Wendy's question. You can certainly take Wendy's question as a powerful and profoundly important statement in itself, where the answer is, I have no idea why it is a question, but it never should be. That's the answer I think that, that probably best reflects Wendy's voice. But I want us to be a little more curious. Uh, just take 30 seconds and either jot down or frame in your head. Uh, why is there always a question? So I want to think for just a couple minutes about the, the big topic of freedom. And I just noticed that I made a mistake. Excuse me for one second while I repair it. Okay. So the first um, sort of distinction that I've found helpful is to think about two senses of freedom and what I want to talk about first is the, the big freedom. And then we'll talk about freedom in the context of the keys for citizenship. So one distinction that I find helpful is the difference between freedom from and freedom for. And freedom from means that you have the space to do what you choose to do and on a day-to-day -day basis and in a larger sense, you're not experiencing any more than typical limits on what you're able to do. So that's freedom from. And if I were involved in many, many, many support services for people with developmental uh, disabilities, uh, freedom from would be one of my deepest concerns because I would be more or less at the mercy of the setting that I was being served in uh, and people would be um, in my face all the time <laughs> uh, and I would want to be free from that. 
But freedom four is, I think, the question beyond that, a question that has to do with what am I going to do with this freedom? And one of the things that's instructed and inspired me, uh, I've been trying to figure this stuff out. It'll be 51 years next week uh, that I started work with people with intellectual disabilities. And folks like these have, people that are pictured here have taught me uh, an enormous amount. They have co-created supports for their citizenship. And so they and their allies have benefited their communities and themselves. And so their examples, not only of freedom from, because they, these folks all have control of an individual budget, they have pretty good uh, options in terms of controlling the supports that they receive uh, day to day. Um, and so we can begin to raise the question, what are you gonna do with this one wild, wonderful thing called your life, as Mary Oliver asked in one of her poems? So by co-creating sports, these folks and their allies have benefited their communities and themselves. Their answer about Freedom Four has a number of dimensions, different people on the, on the screen. Their acts of citizenship engage them with other citizens, uh, disabled and not, to make progress on community issues that affect the common good. These are people variously engaged in efforts to achieve economic justice and uh, push back poverty, uh, material poverty. People are engaged in efforts with their fellow citizens to work on housing and homelessness issues, to deal with questions of transportation. And these issues may not resonate as much for, your, for you in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, but these are uh, fundamental and profound community issues uh, where, where we live. Uh, bullying and hate crime, the health of the planet, access to the arts, hospitality to neighbors and refugees, all these people who represent a pretty wide range of requirements for assistance uh, have used their freedom for uh, these purposes among others, as well as having as good a time as they can and making friends and having a day that makes sense to them. But I think one of Simon's contributions, and by the way, I am not speaking for Simon, I'm speaking for me as a reader and listener to Simon's thinking about the keys to citizenship. So this could be total nonsense from his point of view, but it's the way that I make sense of the keys to citizenship. So these are the keys, right? These are the keys and freedom's one of them. And it's our topic today, but any one of these in isolation makes no sense. Simon doesn't depict these as seven separate keys. He depicts them as, uh, as one with seven aspects. So that's the sort of freedom as one of the aspects of the keys to citizenship. But there's a purpose behind the whole thing, which is in, implied in uh, the title of his and Wendy's uh, reinterpretation of his book. And it's that this is the key to citizenship. This is not the key to do whatever you want. Uh, and it's not necessarily the key to uh, live a disengaged life. The purpose uh, of the keys is to give people access to good opportunities to use their freedom for 
the exercise of their citizenship. And uh, I like this understanding of freedom a lot. This is a person from Wiltshire in the UK, in England, uh, who said, what citizenship means to me is I belong to this place and I can act from responsibility for it. And I think for me, it's important to think about freedom and citizenship as uh, critically important, in a critically important relationship with each other since they're reciprocally contingent, right? The, the more I exercise my freedom in the context of citizenship, the more freedom I have uh, as time goes by, the more uh, real wealth uh, accumulates in my life. So if we think just about the, the littler freedom, the, the key to citizenship freedom, uh, my definition of that, simply enough, is effective control of sufficient resources to experience the benefits and fulfill the duties of citizenship. And effective control is, the, is an important part of that for me because we got lots of people in loads of places in the world who allegedly have control of the public resources that are invested uh, in assisting them, but do not in any sense have effective control of those resources because there are strings and uh, sticky notes and policies piled all over uh, people's capacity to, to be in control. And because the systems that people rely on uh, continue to limit. Uh, so violence extinguishes freedom. And I don't think we can talk about freedom without talking about violence of three kinds. Simone Weil, the great philosopher of community, says violence is that X that turns anybody who is subjected to it into a thing. Violence is that X that turns anybody who is subjected to it into a thing. And violence is woven into North American, anyway, culture and society uh, as normal, natural, expectable in the lives of people with disabilities. So the quest for freedom is a continuing struggle. It's not just a matter of somebody changing their policy or doing some staff training or whatever it is. The quest for freedom is a continuing struggle and freedom is claimed in action. It's not, it can't be given you. It has to be claimed by your action, your action in context of your alliances, your action in context of your uh, uh, allies. So there's three kinds of violence, at least. I'm indebted to my friend and teacher Otto Scharmer for this distinction. There's direct violence, abuse and neglect. Uh, last week when I was thinking about this session, uh, this is what came through the email, the next few examples. Um, the first one came announcing that a coroner's inquest in Manchester had ruled that the Royal Manchester Infirmary uh, was seriously implicated in the death of Joe, Joe O'Leary. Uh, they starved him to death, um, basically, over 26 days, uh, despite the presence of a number of his allies. Uh, and although the inquest took three years to happen, uh, it's established the culpability of the physicians and nurses at the Royal Manchester Infirmary for Joe's death. So there's direct violence, abuse, and neglect. 
the next day I looked in my email and found the Australian NDIS announcing that the federal government takes action to get 6,000, as it turns out, younger people out of aged care homes. What the hell 6,000 people are doing in aged care homes is a puzzle. Uh, why anybody is living in an aged care home is a puzzle to me. And that seems to me to be an example of what we could call structural violence. That is the natural exclusion and expectation of compliance in the lives of people with disabilities. It's just the way it is. And that naturalness, that making exclusion and the expectation of compliance natural affects the feelings, thinking, and sense of possibility of people with disabilities themselves every bit as much as it affects me. Another structural violence example came uh, two days later. Uh, the NHS in England uh, since uh, 2012 has been quote unquote transforming care. So they're making sure community services are ever so much better. And what we noticed, my friend Chris Hatton says, is the number of children and people in inpatient units. These are kids, young people who are uh, banged up in something called assessment and treatment units. They're institutional uh, settings uh, by another name. So somehow or other, in the face of this major and hugely funded uh, initiative, we've got an increase rather than a decrease of young people growing up in institutions. Um, and again, it's because people are tangling with what's natural. So we need to remember, I think, that in addition to the people that are currently testing the limits of freedom and testing those limits in a remarkable and extremely positive way, there are also hundreds and thousands of people left stuck uh, in places where exclusion and the expectation of compliance are structural, have nothing much to do with the, the attitudes, for example, of staff people, although they shape attitude and constrain behavior. Uh, next, from the uh, conference that the folks that stay up late in uh, England, uh, they're still campaigning for no bedtimes for people who live in group homes. And this is, uh, this came up for a woman that I know, uh, John McCarty is a very powerful uh, advocate with uh, autism and substantial communication supports. And uh, he's a wonderful coach and speaker for all of us. And Susan wanted to go, but she called up that I won't need to ride. The staff won't let me go because I had a behavior. Uh, this is an American thing. I had a behavior. Lots of people with disabilities learn to say that about themselves. Uh, so you can go. Be, you can go to self advocacy as long as the staff let you. The third and the least visible form of violence is attentional violence. And attentional violence is not to be seen in terms of your own highest future possibility, but in terms of your past system to find deficiencies. So you end up uh, being defined by a professional view that's aimed at your deficiencies and that is a critical part of natural exclusion and the expectation that you'll live in compliance. So that's my sort of introductory bit. Uh, we could take minutes if we want them for any kind of 
thoughts that people might have or things you want to raise. Otherwise, we'll move on to Leanne. So anything come into your minds? Rachel? Yeah, I'm just going to jump in here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, John, because I think the thing I was trying to articulate at the start in the check-in uh, check was this idea of structural violence. So, um, yeah, that's just become a lot clearer to me, and I guess I have, a, I guess, a more succinct way of articulating actually what it was that I've been, I guess, experiencing in terms of seeing um, with the clients I've been supporting and I guess why, you know, I sort of was seeing these things and these examples and I was like, why am I getting so frustrated and, and upset by this? I was like, I, you know, but I was struggling, I guess, to put this word to it. So I just wanted to say that that has really, um, I guess, highlighted for me what it is that we're trying to, uh, um, I guess, highlight and in, in terms of the work that I do to advocate on behalf um, or for or to support my clients to advocate for themselves uh, is that this was it and um, so thank you for that. Sure. And one of our potential difficulties is that our own desire to assist in people's liberation, we shrink our appreciation of freedom to the size of what we can do as you said so clearly, Rachel, about I, I ha if I understood, I have the experience of empowering a person in a moment when I'm with them. And that's a beautiful and ethical move. But in some people's lives, that's happening in a context that shrinks freedom to what you can do in the moment that you're there and creates a dilemma uh, about uh, what do we do in that situation? And one way to get out of the, the hard part of that is to shrink our sense of freedom to you're free to sit on the couch every night and watch Jeopardy and, you know, eat potato chips. Uh, I have nothing against sitting on the couch eating potato chips. If that's all your freedom's for, uh, that may be a pretty attenuated sense of freedom. Other thoughts? Okay, I need some technical assistance. How do I get me off the screen here? <laughs> okay, so John, if you, um, you should be able to go up to, if you put, put your cursor up to the top of the screen. Yeah. You should have a bar that drops down. It should say, stop sharing your screen. Okay, so if I stop share, it won't blow up. I won't lose you. No. That's no. what I wanted to know. There we go. We're all back. Uh, no, you're not on my screen. Not on your screen. Okay. So just check, John. Oh, in I got your... it. You've got it? I got it. Yep. Got Thank you. Apologies for my Zoom incompetence. Brilliant. Thank you. So, Leanne, Bridget, it's your turn. Bridget, I think Bridget had a question. Oh, I'm thought. sorry. Uh, it's probably not a question. I just wanted to say again, thank you. It's kind of uh, really nice for you to break down violence into those kind of three areas. It's really clarifying. And I guess um, the bit that it's kind of uh, resonating with me is that I spent some time last week at the NDIS Restrictive Practices um, uh, kind of roll out some of the stuff around that and um, I've spent some time this week with a young man who's living in the community and in actual fact when I look at some of the stuff that's going on and there are restrictive practices happening in that his home in the community there's some stuff around 
intentional violence, looking at who he was in the past, but also then some of those other structural violence things that step in really quickly in terms of trying to maintain his freedom from perhaps going into the justice system, but in actual fact, creating a prison in the community. So it was, mm -hmm. yeah, it was quite a powerful conversation. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and we're discovering in the United States that, that you can literally spend $3,000 a day on reproducing prison conditions uh, in a situation that's actually worse because uh, a person is under continual surveillance. If you're actually in jail or even actually in most institutions, you're seldom monitored nearly as closely. The sort of panoptic effect of being under the gaze of, of uh, supervision is uh, intensified and it drives people crazy literally drives people uh, insane. There's a comment here in the chat that says, would intentional violence be what sometimes is experienced in learning support classrooms? And I would bet that that's true. I would bet that, that it's a great temptation for everybody, including maybe some of the students themselves to see themselves in terms of uh, a history of deficiency that limits future possibility rather than to see themselves as, as uh, the last session talked about as uh, on a quest for meaning. Uh, I think uh, unless we sort of think about freedom for being freedom to engage uh, in the quest for meaning that your last session discussed, uh, uh, then we're, we're shrinking our idea of freedom unnecessarily. And to everybody's de detriment, it isn't, it isn't just to the detriment of the person, although that's fundamental, it's also the detriment of the community and the person's family and the people who love a person. John, one of the thoughts that came up for me when you were talking was in relation to the kind of um, institutional type violence. And as you know, we've got the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And in an older person's context, we have consumer directed care. So both schemes essentially are trying to move the cash closer to people and families. But as you beautifully said, they have sticky notes all over it and policy all over it that actually gives so little freedom unless it is almost kind of self-serving of the industry. So you've got the freedom to buy lots of support work, not necessarily buy or purchase things that you think would make a difference. And I think for me anyway, I, I despair at that because we fought so hard to get both schemes in the UK and Australia to, to move the cash closer to people and families. But the bit that I'm holding on to, that I just want to say I'm really grateful for, is the, the comment that you made about the quest for freedom is a continuing struggle. Mm -hmm. And if we don't keep showing the governments what a ridiculous post-it note or you know, noose that they've got around some of this funding, it'll never change. So um, thank you for that. I feel fired up. And I almost want to walk out of the room with me arm up and say, we can do it. So thank you. Okay. Nick? Uh, I might piggyback off what you just said, Kate. Um, but I also just want to yeah, echo Rachel and Bridget's thanks to you, John. Um, I found that really enlightening and particularly appreciated the distinction between those three different kinds of violence and the language that you've used there. But the language is really strong to me, the language around violence. It's very emotive. And I've, I've, there's something in the use of language, the, the, the words that we use that makes me question like, it, uh, are they helpful tools for action? And uh, yeah, if I, I, when, I, when I look at those three different kinds of violence that you've outlined, that, that first one around violence, abuse, neglect, like I think it's pretty hard for people to, I mean, appreciating that those actions still take place every day in all kinds of contexts. But I think when you have a conversation with most people about those kinds of violence, people would kind of identify, oh yeah, we're, we're all on the same page here. No violence, abuse, neglect. No, that's not happening here. 
um, I'm, I'm not contributing towards that. Um, the, the other kinds of violence, the structural violence and the attentional violence, are, that to me, they're almost a little bit more subtle and insidious and, you know, ones that I think so many more of us are much more guilty of on such a regular basis. And we all kind of contribute towards the structures that do lead to structural violence and attentional violence. Um, and so for me, there's some, there seems to be something quite powerful in positioning the structural violence and the attentional violence really closely alongside the direct violence, abuse and neglect to get us to see that actually those things are just as damaging to people, if not more so damaging. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm reflecting on. I guess my question is, um, yeah, in kind of in line with what Kate's saying around, you know, it is this, it is this continuing struggle. Um, so I'm curious as to your thoughts, John, or, or others thoughts on, what is it that that can really help to increase awareness around violence in the forms that it exists uh, and in a way that leads to action? Yeah, well, I think it begins in relationship and in mindfulness. Uh, I think uh, appreciating both people's resilience in the face of having their freedom constrained or completely taken away and people's capacity to keep looking for more in their lives highlights the way that the journey is rigged against people. And one of the things about structural violence is we have responsibility for it. I'm not sure that it's helpful to be guilty about something that you didn't create, that, that by definition has to do with the way society has decided to deal with its resources and with those people who require access to public resources in order to have the assistance they need uh, to live a life that's meaningful to them. I don't know that I don't know that it makes a lot of sense It makes more sense to me to be responsible about that and mindful about it and be in the kind of relationship that can reveal both the ways in which people are constrained that we take for granted and also the keys to citizenship, right? I think the keys to citizenship is one really great way to think about what does it take to undo uh, this structural violence and my only thought is one of the key, one of the things about that that freedom makes us aware of is how natural it is for people with disabilities to be unfree that's not a very good answer i don't think but there you go i think it's pretty right Things that um, I guess we've been learning more about in walking alongside people is the framework that John's just talked about, like the particularly attentional violence and structural violence, is for how do we recognise, genuinely recognise when that's, when we see that, when we feel it, when people are experiencing it, and the things that can help reduce that. And um, uh, good people, myself included, you know, being in the service system for disability sector for many years, um, is we do reduce our, our view on, as John was talking about, about what people, uh, the, I guess the harm that's been created with um, a reframing of well it's the justifying of well they've got they're in this situation because of this and then what does it take to if you think about attentional violence what does it take to challenge that view of uh, people's past and how they've been seen and the lack of opportunities that come from that and the lack of exploration of the keys of citizenship with people around what does a life 
look like for them that includes love and purpose and, you know, having control of my money and also having the support that I need. And so I guess our learnings, again, it's not something, as you said, Nick, it's not something that the, the abuse and neglect is very easy to see. And so how do we become more focused on the things that aren't as easy to see because um, in living in situations with really good people and really good staff and really good organisations, but still with lots of um, attentional, um, if not structural violence that's going on around them. And the power in reflecting back on the, the, the keys of citizenship in um, exploring that, what we've seen anyway is it's no long, it becomes no longer freedom within walls or freedom within chains. It becomes something that is, um, it's not just freedom on its own or people being able to, to say what they want and need. It's actually about all of the stuff around it. Um, so I think that attentional violence is what we've found as being um, certainly a starting point in, in where does this violence occur and where does, yeah. That's my thoughts for now. Okay. Leanne, have you got the next slot? Uh, yes, so part of, part of what John and I were sharing when we've um, caught up about this is, I guess, going a bit deeper into um, the things that make a difference. So it's very, um, as we've all talked about this morning, there can be so much that can impact on, on us as, as people who walk alongside others. Um, to feel powerless ourselves and to feel that the effects of the structural um, and attentional violence because we see it and feel it and hear it with the people that we're supporting. Just, just having a bit of a check in with everyone around the things that, have, that you've found that have helped people to experience more freedom and the things that have made a difference around lessening those attentional structural violences um, to where you felt more empowered in supporting someone. Anyone willing to share? I've got one. I can think of one from a kind of organisational context. I can think of a number in terms of individually, but uh, um, one of the things that I'm incredibly proud of with Avivo is that as an organisation, they stand alongside people and families and uh, are willing to, to go wherever it needs to go to challenge some funding decisions, decisions around how people want to use their, their money, decisions around um who and how people want to employ people um yeah because that can be a pretty scary thing to do i think alone as one family um so yeah kind of creating some kind of um shield wall um arm in arm together really saying we agree with your uh, your common sense and we uh, are willing to stand alongside you with that Rachel? I guess um, just as a, a different perspective in terms of working alongside um, individuals, so I guess a more individual example is in terms of my, my work, um, I will tend to ask a lot of questions because it, is, it can be really difficult when you're working alongside someone 
who I guess has other people supporting them or may, maybe is engaging with a lot of different other agencies. So I guess maybe, um, you know, you don't want to approach things in a way that invokes a negative response because that can then be a barrier, I guess, to creating change. Um, so I guess my general approach in terms of a very practical thing is to be asking a lot of questions. So if this person has a bad time, oh, that's interesting, you know, tell me why that is because I think it is that asking questions, um, you know, I guess helps keep us all accountable. So asking questions of myself even is, you know, why did I choose to do that in that way? Why did I respond in that way? Why did I make that choice in, in my work alongside that person? So it's asking questions of myself, asking questions of the person we're working with, you know, um, and asking questions of other agencies and other service providers, because I think it, we cannot do anything about these, particularly as Nick said, some of these, I guess, forms of violence can be hard to spot. So it's looking at where we are asking the questions in order to move towards this idea of, I guess, establishing a better practice. Does anyone else have anything that they can share around the things that they've learned that um, assists people to exercise their freedom? Okay, so one of the things that um, our, we've had some, we've, I guess, over many years in supporting people, particularly where um, there may be quite a lot of attentional or structural violence, but particularly around attentional violence, if I focus on that for a minute, um, one of the things that we continue to see is um, the things that make a difference around challenging attentional violence is, is, is as um, I know many of you who have um, connected with and worked with also understand is that um, the exploration of who people are and what's possible. And I think that, um, and the belief in people and the belief that people have in themselves, the person and or their family to unchain themselves from um, the, the past and the history and the um, experiences that they had that allows them to open up something different around exploring who they, who they actually are, what's possible for people, um, and around those keys of citizenship that, that we've been talking about and how it sits within a, a, um, a construct of this is about all of us and this is about all the elements that we feed into. So... Um, particularly where people are vulnerable to um, having increased attentional and structural violence, which then can easily lead to the um, abuse and neglect and being seen as other and what challenges being people be seen as something other. And I guess what we've seen is, is really, particularly for those people who are vulnerable, is really focusing on those elements as a way of um, intentionally focusing on those elements as a way of uh, decreasing the, particularly the attentional violence towards people. John, do you have anything to add to those? I, th I think it's a wonderful question that you raise uh, this, because I think if we can take responsibility for noticing how we're supporting the reproduction of the expectation that people will be excluded, expectation that people must comply. Uh, anytime we can kind of catch ourselves and see that as an opportunity for learning with a person, 
And as you said, any investment that we can make of our own time, our own talent, our own gifts uh, in walking with the person to discover where meaning lies for them, uh, where their own gifts are, and holding the expectation that people will want the fullness of citizenship and not just the freedom to be at the margin and eat what they want and go to bed what they when they want and and so forth those things about going to bed where you, when you want and eating when you want are critical but so often we limit our own appreciation of what people's freedom is for um, and i think anytime we can notice us uh, that story that it's natural for people to be excluded that the they belong with their own kind story is one that it's really important to figure out how to how to notice its pervasiveness and and uh, and respond to it and this image of walking with people seems uh, like a very powerful one to me So maybe we take just a minute to look at the, to look at this the, the proper way uh, in, the in the context of the the uh, in the context of the keys to citizenship. This will only a couple of minutes. Um, so let me. CM I need to do here share you know I'll get this by gosh I have it long enough okay oops can't figure out how to are you sharing your screen again, John? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> you're trying to. Okay. Your screen seems to have frozen a, a little, actually, so I don't know if that's having an impact. So, so down the bottom in the middle, if you put your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, there should be a share button. And it should give you some options. The one that's usually the one that's highlighted, if you just click share, that's the one that works. I never thought in a million years I'd be giving IT advice. <laughs> um, Can you see what I'm projecting or not? No, I can't. So your camera's gone off. So if you just try again, so the cursor down the bottom. Should, if you click on the share button, it should come up with um, a basic screen, it says, and it should have one of your screens kind of green highlighted and you should just be able to click share. That's it. We've got you. All right. So uh, the one in the pocket is uh, Tia Nellis and uh, Tia is uh, advocacy specialist at the University of Illinois in Chicago, the president of Self-Advocates Be Empowered, the national self-advocacy organization in the United States. And this is what she said at a worldwide symposium of people concerned about self-directed supports. She said to the, to the whole audience, we are going to live self-directed lives and we need all of you to help us do it. And I think the self in self-directed, at least in North American culture, is ridiculously easy to understand, to misunderstand. 
it's ridiculously easy because of the pervasiveness of individualism in uh, the U.S. anyway, uh, to see self as singular, to see self as from others, to see others as potential interferers in people's self-direction and self-determination. And one of the things that people with cognitive impairments uh, in particular uh, remind me is that interdependence is the key to freedom. That a notion of independence that says you do it yourself and you have no obligation and no responsibility and no duties uh, is a false freedom. So effective control of sufficient resources to experience the benefits and fulfill the duties of citizenship means to some people that by moving the cash to the person, we're gonna end up with the same structure just flipped over. And I think it's critical to put a big question mark in that because I think it results, it, it seldom results in effective control. It seldom res results in the kind of control that degrees the degrees of freedom in your life. So it's not as simple as flipping who the boss is. And one of the things we've been looking really carefully at in some wonderful organizations uh, that genuinely do work for people rather than work on people or, uh, you know, take over uh, that arc of supervision uh, that Katrina uh, mentioned uh, in our introduction. Uh, organizations that seriously try to put the person in charge as we're looking more and more carefully of how those relationships actually work and what actually happens, they don't look like this. The person and the staff, that structure uh, doesn't describe what's really there. So it seems to me that effective control is actually a, a social self, a relational self, a self that's got other selves, right? Uh, so this is a diagram about, of uh, Lisa, uh, one young woman, uh, and that's kind of the core of people who are companions together looking for the freedom to make a difference in their community. So these people share a commitment to strive together to act as equals with different capabilities and roles. And this I think is another one of the insights that Simon Duffy has that I think is extremely powerful that equality isn't inconsistent with difference. Uh, and because uh, support workers for Lisa who can struggle enormously with self-regulation and becomes dysregulated and uh, requires uh, a lot of support when that happens, um, that doesn't take away the responsibility to strive to act as equals, even though we don't quite know what to do some of the times when dysregulation lasts for long periods of time and involves a great deal of violence toward uh, her violence toward herself and toward other people. Uh, all we can do is say, we're gonna keep struggling <laughs> to act as equals here and continue to search for meaningful ways that she can contribute to the common good. One of the things that seems critical to me is the only way that we're going to be slowly chip, chipping away at the profound social devaluation that makes exclusion and the expectation of control natural is when people with disabilities are willing to do the work of inclusion, are willing to do the work of showing up in situations where the risk of being misunderstood, the risk of being rejected, the risk of having a reproduction of 
exclusion happen is real, although much less real than we fear in my experience. Uh, the work of inclusion has to be done uh, by all of us, but all of us has to include people with disabilities themselves. And uh, Lisa benefits greatly from her connection to uh, an advocacy network that happens to be uh, uh, inclusive rather than simply uh, people who share uh, her impairment. Um, and one of the things that seems really important to me to pay attention to is if we're listening to create greater space for freedom, we have to recognize that our job isn't, I think, as simple as taking direction, as accepting commands, right? That there's a way to understand listening that says, you're the boss, so whatever you say, I've got to do. That's rhetorically interesting, but impractical uh, with many people who require skilled assistance in order to, in order to facilitate their participation. But it also misses the fact that there are much deeper forms of listening than simply taking instructions. And so I apologize for the jargon. English sometimes isn't my first language. I don't know quite what my first language is, but I say things in very clumsy ways. And this is probably said in a clumsy way. But what I mean to say here is we need to recognize that our listening is constitutive. Our listening constitutes uh, in relationship with the other people in this circle here. Listening constitutes a social reality and, ha and is remarkably powerful to build commitment, to energize people's practical imaginations, and to encourage people to cross the community boundaries that exclusion natural and reproduce exclusion on a regular basis and reinforce its justifications. So to me, the key to the cash working when we get it in a form that people can actually direct it and when people have the grounding of a good home, the help that they need, a sense of purpose, uh, and uh, when people have loving relationships, um, when those things are there, uh, then the big kind of freedom that we were talking about uh, has a chance to grow. So we need, in my view, a deeper understanding that we're only just beginning to get because as Kate was saying, some of us live with broken hearts uh, around very promising experiments in creating the purple flag freedom, it actually given people and the people who love them effective control of money. And we here in this part of Wisconsin where I am today, we demonstrated 30 years ago that literally giving people cash money in their hand was more effective in preventing uh, people from having to go to nursing homes and other institutional arrangements um, that, and was far more cost effective. We've got evidence of it. It's just that societally we can't, we can't tolerate uh, that kind of freedom for people that we devalue. And we'll only push back at that devaluation as we ally with people with disabilities to open up the freedom that they need um, for a meaningful contribution and meaningful relationship with an increasingly diverse uh, group of people. So that's, uh, that's, that's it from me.
Thank you, John. Thank you, Leanne. So if we, I'll just wait until you show your screen. Where's everybody's thinking gone then? So, Katrina, that was a big sign. I couldn't even hear you. <laughs> Tell us what's going on for you. To be really honest with you, for all the years I've worked in community services, I've always viewed a lot of the violence that I see as structural violence, particularly with the clinical system. Um, attentional violence, I've never actually even heard of before, but oh my, has that framed me in actually where I see certain um, rights taken away from people. And it's definitely something I'm going to be talking to my team about in terms of how, well, I've been around for a long time and I've never heard of it. So I want to talk to my girls about, my team, about, you know, exploring this with them because I think that is such a powerful place to start in actually asking ourselves, what's our buy-in around this? Where do we see this and how can we actually affect change? I already know where I can affect change. I always thought our clinical system was quite broken here in Western Australia in terms of mental health. But I've worked with some fantastic people that have to work in that system. So I don't know that the system's broken, but what I do think I see is a lot of the attentional violence within clusters of groups of people that work in the system. And how do we work with that to change perceptions, change opinions of people, and make a difference for the people that we're, we are walking alongside of? Because this affects us as much as it affects them, I think. It's very big today, like my head's really hurting now. So thank you, John and Leanne, because yeah, it sort of opened up my world a little bit more. Thanks, Katrina. Anybody else? Where's your head gone? Alex, you had your hand up earlier on. Sorry, and I didn't see it until after we'd got stuck in. Is there anything you want to share? Sorry, my audio is not very good here. Um, uh, really, all I was wanting to share before was um, just about sort of um, letting your guard down, you know, when we're supporting people. Um, I obviously worked for big organisations for a long time and now coming out on my own and sort of working with people in the way I want to work with them, it's, uh, or with it, so sort of easier to work with people in the way that they want to be worked with. Um, I guess it's just about sort of not... Um, sorry, it was too long ago. I was thinking about this one. Um, I guess the idea of sort of it's not about what what we want and 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 what what your morals are telling you that that's right. Sometimes you just have to let situations flow and let people sort of discover things for themselves. So that's. That's something that's um, since I started working with people on my own, I've, I've started to see more progress that way. So, sorry, that didn't, that didn't make a lot of sense, but um, but it, it it did to me at the time. <laughs> Makes lots of sense. Thank you, Alex. Anybody else? Sorry, we've got a couple of minutes. Where are your thoughts have gone? Any questions? Nick. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit similar to Katrina. I think uh, my mind is racing, uh, reeling with possibilities. Um, where I've gone, I, and I'm similarly can, keen to carry forward conversations with my team. And um, what's come to mind for me is that, you know, I I just continue to appreciate this approach to talking about citizenship for everybody. So citizenship for the people that we serve, but for ourselves as well. And uh, I think where my mind's gone with this is, you know, uh, connecting with my own experiences of structural and attentional violence. And so I wonder if that's a, a way to start a conversation with my colleagues around, you know, creating a, a safe environment in which we can start having conversations about our own experiences of being subjected to different forms of structural and attentional violence, what that's looked like, how that's been for us. And if that's a way to start raising our, our consciousness around those concepts, being able to nest those concepts within the context of our own lived experiences um, and then see where that can take us for ourselves and, and for others that we serve. I think that's a really important step. 
and I just want to suggest that you remember the second part that is, and the reason you probably haven't heard of attentional violence is we just made it up a little while ago. Um, so the phenomena is not new, but the, the label. Uh, it's to have your highest purpose in terms of the keys, the purpose and meaning uh, that you talked about last session uh, ignored. So there's, you, you can get trapped in reproducing a focus on the past, right? What have people suffered without balancing that with a sense of, so how do we assist people to discover uh, where meaning lies for them? And that was the session uh, last time. And that's partly where my uh, comment about listening constituting not just responding, but, but creating a social field in which uh, we can begin to sense what the highest possibility in our situation is, what, the, what our purpose might be. Um, it seems so important to me and not to stop at following instructions. I don't have any problem with people who provide support following instructions or staying out of the way or whatever, but if that's all that's happening in somebody's life, then we're now writing freedom in littler and littler and littler type. <laughs> freedom is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller instead of bigger, bigger and bigger. So the way out of it is into sensing purpose, I think. Rachel? Yes, um, thanks John. What you've just said there has really resonated with me because I guess I feel like um, what perhaps had been missing in, not intentionally, but I guess had been, I feel like has maybe been missing in my approach sometimes is to look at that freedom too and that bigger part because I think without having both of those senses you're defining freedom in, in something that's too reductive and I think you need both of those parts to you know to have the freedom from but also the freedom to as you said to find that purpose because I think otherwise you can't uh, actually uh, achieve this idea of freedom because I think freedom you can't be you're either free or not free you can't be you know have half a freedom you know um, so I think that uh, and that actually makes me really excited, this idea of, of freedom too, and the, I guess, this sense of possibility of what could be achieved. I think that actually, it leaves me quite excited for moving forward. So yeah, I think this is really, as Nick and as Katrina said, I am coming away with from today with so much to think about. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, Rachel. Um, you know, it really reminds me, John, the thing that keeps running around my head is a couple of years ago, and it's, I mean, it's not a couple of years ago, it's done my head in for years, but the whole kind of notion around self-directed support and individual budgets and the notion of consumerism, um, that that's what this is all about. And that diagram that you showed about, well, flipping the boss is not, we've always, we know that's not the answer. And then social justice, really, and they're completely different constructs, paradigms, but it's like we've kind of all bought hook, line and sinker. It's all about consumerism and that's the answer. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of big thing that's uh, running through my head. Um, it's, we're at time and I hope John and Leanne, you can hear people's gratitude because I can certainly hear it. I feel like I can feel it in Zoom um, for your time this morning and tonight, John, and yours, Steve, in the middle of the night. So i um, really pleased that uh, this was a fabulous session. Um, yeah, can, uh, I just want to say again, on behalf of Citizen Network, thank you to John and thank you to Leanne, but also thank you to everybody who's here. As with all the sessions, you know, everybody's perspective and contribution is absolutely welcomed and, yeah, enriches the whole experience. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And we shall see you in a month um, for our next session. Um, Thank you. Take care. I'll post this up onto Facebook so you can share it with your colleagues, friends, um, and we'll see you again. Thank you very much.
Thank you.